Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel and if you are new here, I'm Ariana and I give you the brightest minds of physical therapy. So if you want to increase your knowledge, start right now by subscribing to this channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up and share with your friends. Today our guest is David Shear and he's been practicing since 1978. He's going to talk about mania therapy and how it changed over the years and how it's impacted by other factors like nutrition, visceral manipulation, medications, brain science, pain science, and much more. I hope you enjoyed the show. Hi, David. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Good morning, Mariana. Thanks for having me. This is great. So let's jump right in. Uh, could you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about yourself, your career, and how did you get to where you are right now? Okay, um, I've got a 42-year history at this point, so it's a pretty long career. I graduated from uh, the University of Maryland uh, at Baltimore in 1978. And uh, since that time, I've been uh, following a, a manual therapy course uh, over that period of time. I, I've done a lot of physical therapy. I was in the Peace Corps in 1980. Yeah, I was a... I was a physical therapist for the Fiji School of Medicine when I got out of school. So my career started out there. So I, I, I sent myself a lot of books and I taught a lot of classes out there for the Fiji School of Medicine for a couple of years. And then when I left there, I left all of my books over there for them. But I had a, I had a class of five uh, students and I helped them interact with the doctors and, and taught different uh, different techniques and different, uh, it was basically a lot of English. <laughs> I had to teach a lot of English. But since that time, I came back and um, I took a lot of courses in different things. I took a McKenzie, I took Maitland, I took Roccobato, I took a lot of different courses. And I found out that uh, they were all very frustrating to me because they were all uh, weekend courses and you came back to the United States and there weren't a lot of people that were familiar with the material and uh, there wasn't a lot of follow-up. And if people in your clinic didn't teach a lot of the courses or take a lot of the courses, then it was very hard to, to integrate all the information. So I spent the next 10 years or so wandering around taking courses before I got to the Ola Grimsby Institute. That was about 1989, I believe. Ola did the first manual therapy residency program in the United States. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. That's he, pretty cool. It was great. I was living here in um, Nashville, and I was looking for more courses to take. I was the director of a clinic, and I saw the advertisement for a full-time residency program that was a two-year program in orthopedic manual therapy, which was what I was interested in. So I uh, called and I got an interview. It was in Charlotte, North Carolina. I went there for an interview and he accepted me to the program. And it was just what I wanted because there were only five uh, therapists admitted to the program. And they had a Norwegian physical therapist, a Norwegian manual therapist fly over from Norway. And we lived with him for for a year and a half, almost two years. So I got what I wanted, which was direct study under a manual therapist with other therapists in the clinic. So I was able to learn it hands-on right from guys that were that had been doing it for a long time. And after that, um, I taught for all, I helped all the right courses. And um, I did that for probably a good 10 or 12 years, in fact, I taught five residency programs here in Nashville. They were two-year programs. I had about 20-some students all together. And at that time, it was a master's degree program. So I taught uh, 20 different students to their master's degree. And that was while I was working for uh, Health South here in Nashville. So that took us up to um, probably early 2000. And I got into private practice for about 10 years, starting in about 2000. I was in private practice for 10 years. And I 
quit Ola Grimsby because the primary pra the private practice was pretty intense, and uh, Ola Grimsby was on the west coast, and I was in the southeast, and it was too much for me. So I quit that, and I started my own private practice and stayed here. And I did that for 10 years, 10 or 12 years before I quit that. And I, then I went with uh, another clinic for about another 10 years. During those 10 years, I, I rewrote a whole curriculum. It's called a certification in orthopedic manual therapy. It's basically uh, a course, eight courses. And I wrote most of those courses and it follows the IFOMP guidelines. You know what IFOMP is, is the International Federation of Orthopedic Manual Therapy. So I wrote those courses based on the international guidelines. And uh, I, I, I would say we probably brought, it was dozens of therapists to the certificate. And I did that for probably 10 or 12 years. And then now with the pandemic, I made another switch so now I'm with another company and I've rewritten these courses for them. And I've just got finished uh, teaching the introductory course, which I now call uh, becoming a multimodal manual therapist. Because I think then we'll, we'll, I will probably get to that here in a little bit, because I think the, the, um, the landscape of physical therapy and manual therapy has changed quite a bit in the 40 years for sure and in the last 10 or 20 years quite a bit as well. So I call it the becoming a multimodal manual therapist because I'm trying to include all the things that uh, are needed to treat a patient, you know, including nutrition and exercise and stuff that wasn't included in the early basic stuff of manual therapy. So that's how I got to where I am right now. A long career. So that's amazing. You you tried everything. You did private practice, you taught courses, you wrote certifications, you yeah. worked with big companies. So I think you experienced it all. So I think that's going to be an interesting conversation. I have more questions coming for you. So let's talk about the manual therapy. So what were the changes that you saw over the years? And well, where has it headed? Well, manual therapy, when I first started taking it, was about 19, in the late 80s and early 90s. It was approach that was taken depending on what part of the world you lived in. So if you took a curriculum from Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, that's what I was involved in, it was all a biomechanical approach. Everything had to do with uh, Arthur kinematics and, and, and joint movement. And, you know, it was felt that most things could be fixed with a biomechanical approach. But if you took courses in another part of the world, like uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, even South America, it was more uh, a neurophysiologic approach. It was uh, Maitland. Um, it was a uh, neuroinhibitory approach. It was joint movement. It was accessory movement. Um, and so there were two schools of thought, and they were never really combined very well, and I found that very frustrating. So as I moved through my career, I noticed that there were different courses being taught in different parts, and so I took a little bit of everybody. And uh, the way it turns out now is that uh, there is no authoritarian approach. That was called authoritarian approach. You you took one guy, you followed McKenzie, or you followed Maitland, or you followed Ola, and you followed them around, and you did this these different courses based on their techniques. That's not the way it's done anymore, because it's all scientific rationale. So whoever has the approach, whether it's uh, myofascial with Barnes or Mulligan, or McKenzie or Maitland or Ola, there's a scientific rationale for why everything was done. And so you don't have to follow one guy anymore. You just understand the basic anatomy and physiology and neuroanatomy and arthrokinematics, and then you can kind of apply all the principles yourself. I think that has been changing because 
it's not like one thing that works for everybody. So some situations you see that one thing works best and then the other situations, other techniques work best. And you just have to, it's just good to know it all and know how to use it and when you use it, right? What? That's really it. I, I was just, the, the course I just taught last weekend, it was a full course and some of these students or some of the clinicians had been practicing 20, 25, 30 years. They're fully trained in McKenzie or Maitland or Mulligan and they're still in these courses. And the reason they're in these courses is because none of the techniques actually work all the time. And if you follow a certain approach, you're gonna find that they work for some patients, they don't work for other patients. Sometimes they work at the beginning of the visit and sometimes they don't work at the end of the visit. So you all, all clinicians want more information and more techniques. So that's why I wrote Becoming a Multimodal Manual Therapist, which means let's use everything that everybody has and let's go ahead and during one visit or during your multiple visits, I'll use a McKenzie technique, a Maitland technique, a Mulligan technique, a Barnes technique, a Grinsby technique, a Norwegian. It doesn't really matter. You just change and adapt according to what the patient presentation is. So that's the biggest yes. change. So that was going to be my next question. So how is this experience being like for you, like teaching, uh, writing courses? and like all of these and like how how do you teach so how do you combine these how is this experience um my basic approach is to start out telling the class and 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 saying that this curriculum is going to be knowledge base and so uh, when you when you go through the hierarchy of learning which you need to do to prepare a course you have to start with knowledge base, you, you can't just teach evaluation techniques or treatment techniques. You have to have an understanding of um, histology, neurophysiology, arthrokinematics, biomechanics, uh, neurophysiology, traumatology, uh, you know, biopsychosocial, the sociology, the psychology. And so to me, I approach these courses by saying that we're going to increase everyone's knowledge base because the bigger your knowledge base is, the more you can layer on your ability to uh, evaluate the patient. You know, um, uh, you know, how can you synthesize all this information to perform an evaluation and make a clinical judgment about what to do next? And you can't go in and get a technique and go back and apply it. It doesn't work. But if you have a, a very broad knowledge base, you can apply any technique. So what I tell all these students, clinicians really, uh, in all these courses is get out your Gray's Anatomy, get out your Netter's book, and get out whatever basic resource book you need and put it on your desk with the patient in your clinic and start learning everything you can about the human body because it will have an application to one of these clinical approaches. The thing that's interesting is all the clinical approaches work. They all work, but they, they don't work all the time. So you have to be able to move between one approach and another. So I just imagine you probably have to try to um, recognize patterns and try to see which technique would probably work best on the situation or try a couple of them or do something like that. And then with experience over the years, you kind of like have this feeling what's going to work best with this patient and the other. So like, do you teach this type of like um, these, I don't know if you could call it approach, but like trying to identify what would potentially works best on this situation? Or you just kind of like go and test everything and see what works? Yeah, that that's, that's a, the answer to that question takes about two days to answer. So the, 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 the answer to that is that um, there are clinical patterns. And so uh, a disc problem, 
and a capsule problem and a facet problem and a ligament problem and a muscle tendon problem, they all, they look, they look, they fit a pattern. So you have to go out into the tissue to find enough comparable signs to fit a pattern. So if you're trained to think everything is a facet problem or everything is a muscle tendon problem, that's kind of what you're going to see. But if you're trained to think, well, it could be a disc and it could be a facet and it could be a ligament and it could be a capsule, each one of those has to fit a pattern. So I could finish with, I could do my objective evaluation, my subjective and objective evaluation, and I'll go, all of these comparable signs, they fit more of a disc problem today. And now they fit, it looks more like of a facet problem and less of a disc problem. So the comparable signs guide my treatment. I'm always thinking in terms of tissue diagnosis because I want to help the patient say, oh, I think this is what it is. Because when you go to a doctor, you ask the doctor, what is it? And um, I like to be able to tell my patients, I think it's a disc problem. I think it's a facet. I think it's a capsule. I think it's a muscle tendon because I found this, 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 and this. So we're going to treat these. And then when these get better and you still have symptoms, we're going to look. Maybe it's another problem with another tissue. We'll treat those too. But I, one of the biggest problems I found in my career is that no one could tell me what the problem was. And so I was always in the dark about what it was. I was always treating symptoms and I was always being frustrated with my results. And that's where the curriculum heads is when you are only treating symptoms, you're really going to go down an approach that is going to be very frustrating for you and the patient because the patient's always going to complain about something. And if you're going with subjective complaints, you're going to get lost. You have to go with objective findings. And, that, and that's what I teach. That's very interesting because I think that's the key. You're just, you, you're not just treating symptoms. You have to really understand what's going on. Um, and then my next question would be, you kind of answer. So if you combine manual therapy with other techniques and if yes, which ones? So how do you use on your practice? Um, I use everybody's technique. So I, I'm not, I not, I don't care which technique I use. I, I'll use an oscillation technique, which was originally a Maitland kind of a thing, or that'll be, that's a neuroinhibitory technique. So I might use that to inhibit pain and guarding. And then I'll use a manual technique that involves joint mobilization to try and improve range of motion. And then if I feel like there's a disc problem going on, I may use a, a centralization technique over the disc and I'll, I'll just go back and forth based on my comparable signs, what technique I think is going to work the best. The biggest problem is always going to be asking the patient, do you feel better? Because sometimes the patient says yes, and sometimes they say no. And if I go by, they don't feel better, I'm going to get stuck because sometimes all the objective clinical signs get better and people still have pain. And I have to say to the patient, I think you're actually better today. I know you still have pain and we're going to work on reducing the pain, but functionally you're getting better. So I have to be able to give objective measures about improvement. I can't go by subjective symptoms because uh, it's too confusing. Yeah. It's easy to get lost because sometimes yeah. their perception is different from the reality. You see range of motion getting better. You see all the other measurements improving and it's still like, oh, I still feel pain. My sensation is still. So I think that's yeah. very important. It's the subjective response that's the most confusing to patients. And it's the patient's perception that's the problem. Uh, the, the patient's history of what's happened to them over the course of their lifetime is going to determine their subjective response. If they have a history of exaggeration, for example, or stoicism, they're 
subjective response is going to be completely different and it's going to throw off my uh, evaluation of the patient. So, and that gets into the field of um, uh, brain science and, and, um, and that's what's going on now is, is how to evaluate and treat the patient with, uh, you know, uh, n- n- neurologic education or neuroeducation or pain science, all of those fields, so, which is what I've been into a lot over the last few years. So how do you deal with these patients um, that have these patterns that we, you just talked about? Um, it depends on their level of uh, subjective interpretation. There are some patients, so we talk about how to, how to handle the patient. So you can do a local intervention where you can go in and mobilize it or manipulate it directly. Sometimes you can't touch them because it hurts too much. So you have to do a regional approach, which means, well, your lumbar is hurting, but I can't touch that today because it hurts. We'll work on your hips or your thoracic. And then there's some patients that are so um, subjectively involved that they don't want you to touch them at all, which means you have to do more of a global type treatment that's neuroinhibitory. We talk about um, breathing or relaxation or somehow detonify the sympathetic nervous system, activate the parasympathetic system. And then maybe if their system goes down a bit, maybe then I can gain access to try and mobilize a joint or get into some, some other region. So, um, it, it, it's hard. It's hard to do, but it's based on the sub patient subjective response. Yeah, I think these are the most challenged patients because it it goes off a little bit from the physiologic aspect of everything that we are trained and used to. So I think it's like a challenge on like how to deal with these patients, how to approach them and try to be effective. So um, I think that's something that all of us are dealing uh, more and more. So I just like to hear your opinion. And so you, we know that manual therapy is impacted by a lot of different factors like nutrition, visceral problems, medications and brain uh, science and pain science that we just talked a little bit about. Yeah. So would you like to talk a little bit about these factors and how they impact on manual therapy? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, where, uh, that's where the course multimodal manual therapy comes in because I think one of the main things we're finding is that, um, for example, uh, nutrition is, has a huge effect on musculoskeletal health. And I've read some recent studies this year and last year, there's a syndrome called metabolic osteoarthritis, which means that the way that you're eating affects the health of your tissue. It's acknowledged that your eating patterns will, you know, cause uh, cardiovascular disease and liver dysfunction and gall- gallbladder issues and stomach issues. Well, now it's been now it's being determined that uh, the nutritional factors can cause osteoarthritis, and so we've got to start talking to patients about their nutritional health because it's not only going to affect their triglycerides and their heart health; it's going to affect the integrity of their musculoskeletal tissue and their joints. And I'm sure over the years, it's gonna be found out that it affects not just the cartilage, which is a, you know, which is a chondrocyte, it's gonna affect the fibroblasts, it's gonna affect the ligaments and the disc and the muscle tendon and all that. So I think nutrition is the probably one of the biggest things. And in terms of visceral health, I, I know that I've treated a, a lot of patients over the years that for a long time, I was seeing mid thoracic problems that looked exactly like facet irritations and they wouldn't respond to therapy. Um, they would, but temporary would come back before I, I finally understood that um, the gallbladder was referring to the thoracic spine. And so I had to ask about digestive health and Everything in the center of your body, from your gallbladder, your liver, your lungs, your heart, and your esophagus, can all refer back to the thoracic spine. So 
uh, this you have to ask patients about their visceral health. And it's not that we're going to make any medical determinations, but it impacts a percentage of their symptoms, a percentage of the subjective complaints of pain. So we should be able to talk to patients and ask them about all these other aspects. And if needed, you just say, well, I think you probably need to see your physician because I don't have enough comparable signs to get you better. The problem in your back is probably coming from somewhere else. I think that's crazy, uh, especially like nutrition. Uh, I think it's something very new, or at least people don't talk much about it, like combining these with physical therapy, at least like the physical therapists themselves. I don't think um, we learned that I didn't, at least in college, like how, how it impacts. I think it's, so I'm just curious, like, how do you study that? Like, how did you learn that? Did you go like uh, just researching by yourself? There is courses that they teach about it or they talk about it. For the, for the visceral health? Nutrition, the nutrition. Yeah, so there's there's just a lot of courses on the market right now where you can, uh, just this past summer, I took a, a 12-hour course and a couple other podcasts. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of articles and books out on uh, a, a big word that's being used right now is the microbiome, uh, which is the which is your intestines. So your your intestinal health has now been shown. You have trillions of cells in there that are viruses, bacteria, fungus that are responsible for the health of your body. And depends on what you eat, depends on the health of your uh, microbiota. There's only a one cell difference between the membrane of your intestines and your bloodstream. So anything you eat goes right into your bloodstream, which then affects your circulation. And then it's called the gut brain axis. So that if you eat something, it's going to break down into certain, uh, you know, chemical compounds, which then affect your mental health. So, it passes not only through your gut axis uh, to your bloodstream, but then it passes through the blood brain barrier and it, it affects your mental health. So the courses are all over the market. Um, you know, they're just, they're just everywhere. And I, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, the gut brain axis and the microbiome and how to eat to improve that. I mean, it, it's been shown now that, uh, you know, um, I'm blanking on the name, the probiotics. It's it, even the probi your probiotic health in your intestine has an effect on your physical health and your, your mental health as well. And it's going to, in my opinion, it's going to be shown over the years that certain parts of your intestines has certain uh, probiotics that affect certain mental diseases and psychological health. So at a certain point, we're going to be now we take certain probiotics and it'll be take this probiotic to improve this aspect of your health, probably. But but it's really in the infancy stage, I think, of nutrition right now. That's crazy. I think that's super interesting and something is just uh, good to stop and take a look at it because it impacts the treatment for sure. So right. it's crazy. And um, the vice, visceral problems, it's, um, so in Brazil, I'm from Brazil, and there we can um, study, do like osteopathic. And then yeah. I, I did the specialization and I learned about the visceral part of treatment. But uh, here, I think it's way less common people doing this treatment. So I always like to hear about and how and here like how did you learn like did you do like the specific cards like the a pleasure or something so how do you how do you learn about that and people that are interested in learning more about that connections well um i teach a course within this eight group of course i teach a course called a uh, medical screening for the orthopedic manual therapist and and I use a book by um, Jean-Pierre Barral, who's a French osteopathic physician. Um, and what I do in that course is I teach how each system 
impacts musculoskeletal health. And in the course, I also teach how to palpate each organ to the degree you can palpate an organ. Some you can and some you can't. But it's those courses that I've learned that I now teach that helps the therapist. For example, I've had patients where their back pain is not getting better, but I'll be palpating their ascending colon, their descending colon, uh, their appendix, their stomach. And as I palpate, they'll say that's sending the, the same pain to my back. I've had triathletes tell me that they're not resolving their SI pain. And I had a woman in New Jersey tell me they, in her lower intestines, was referring directly to her sacroiliac joint. So what we do is we learn about where all the viscera are in the body, what their function is, and then we just go ahead and try and palpate them to try and reproduce some of their symptoms with another comparable sign. And if that's the case, you can talk, you can ask screening questions about health of that viscera. And if it's an issue, you tell them that they need to see their physician again, because it's outside the scope of my practice to do anything with viscera, but it is within the scope of my practice to refer them to a physician if I think that that's, you know, where the next step in their health come, comes in. Yeah, and being able to assess that and help the patient just guide and referral, I think it's available. It's just take us to another level so you can like really screen the patient and help and quickly refer, recognize what they need and just refer them. So I think that's it's just amazing. Um, one more thing we would talk about is the medication. So how do you think the medication impact manual therapy? Uh, the medication has a big impact on manual therapy, uh, mainly uh, NSAIDs and cortisone. So the it's been shown that uh, NSAIDs, um, over-the-counter NSAIDs even, uh, it weakens the health of the collagen. And so from a histologic standpoint, most of our, all of our patients are complaining about damage to a fibroblast or a chondrocyte, some piece of collagen is damaged. That's what they're telling us. And the health of the collagen is impacted not just from the nutrition, but from the medication that they're taking. So in the case of cortisone, it weakens the health of the collagen. And in the case of uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, it weakens the collagen. So Anything that we do to the patient in terms of mobilization or exercise, um, we have to pay attention to the weaker parts of the collagen because most therapists um, I found over the years overdo their treatment and they're not taking into account the weakest tissue and medication often weakens tissue, nutrition weakens tissue, and we have to dose the patient down in terms of how much uh, stress we're going to apply to weak collagen. So medication is very important. And not only that, if the patient is uh, highly, has a high sympathetic tone, for example, they're always agitated, they always have anxiety, they have a high sympathetic tone, that means that their system is producing cortisol all the time, which is, you know, it's an anti-inflammatory in some ways, but the cortisol tends to weaken the collagen too. It's just a derivative of cortisone. So uh, the mental health and nutritional health and the, uh, and the, uh, the medication all, all impacts the tissue health. I, th I love your broad view about all these factors because many times we don't pay attention to them. So if other therapists that are here, like are listening to us here on the podcast, if they are interested in taking a course, they can take a course with you, like you offer to all the public, or it's just for this clinic that you work? How, how does it work? At the moment, these courses are, because of COVID and everything, these courses are just being offered within the company that I'm with now. Um, okay. I have taught some of these courses to hospitals and other therapists in the past, but at the moment that's not being done. Okay. So if people wanted to keep an eye on your uh, schedule, do you have like a website or something that they can take a look maybe in the future <laughs> when you, you know, when this pandemic 
uh, we get over this this phase? I I, I actually don't have a website. Um, I, anybody can contact me. I guess that's okay. Um, okay. Uh, that, that would do be you okay. have Do you have like a email or something that yeah, people can? Uh, they can use my work. You? They can use my work email, David dot at starpt.com and I, I take oh. all questions through there. I'm willing to, you know, work with anybody. We'll talk about any patient at any time. That's fun for me. So I'm happy to do that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and let's go to our final questions. So okay. what is your favorite resource of information? Any books or specific papers you like? I get my information from everywhere. Um, I use PubMed off the internet a lot. So I'm, I'm looking at a lot of recent studies. Um, I still like my anatomy books the best. Um, anything that can tell me about uh, the, my, anything that's gonna broaden my knowledge base. I, I've done a lot of recent study on, on brain function and, and uh, the path, the ascending and descending pathways to the central nervous system. Just learning about that information uh, impacts patient care and uh, directly. So I get my information from everywhere. Okay. Uh, and what would be the best advice you can give to the physical therapists that are starting their careers? Probably, I would say to approach the patient and approach the profession with a lot of humility because we, we just don't know. And the best thing is to do is to listen to the patient and don't think that your approach is the only one that's gonna be effective. Um, just approach them with humility because most often we're, we're not right. <laughs> and we, we've got to be willing to, to shift gears and look for, other, look, for, look for other ways of doing things. Very true. Everyone is different, and sometimes what we think is gonna work, they just don't work. So, yeah, doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't. And what personal qualities or abilities do you think are important to become a successful physical therapist? You have to like the human body, and you have to like to study the human body, and I think you have to have good psychomotor skills. So. You know, if you have good eye-hand coordination and good feel for tissue, and that would be the main thing. Um, my career, I was uh, in athletics a long time, so I always had good eye-hand coordination and good feel for tissue, so that always helped me. So that would be the main thing. Okay, uh, great. And um, do you have any social media that people can find you as well? I don't know uh, if you have or not, but I, I don't have anything in particular that I'm that I'm on. So I think we just went through everything. I don't know if you want to add something else that we missed or. I'm I'm satisfied. I think that was that was great. Uh, those were good questions, and I feel, I feel like uh, I I told you what I do. So David, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. And congratulations on, on your journey. I think it's uh, pretty amazing, everything that you've done so far, uh, all your experience. And I love your view um, that is very broad and trying to look at all the factors and all the techniques. There is not just one thing that works. And I think that's very important because sometimes people just get stuck with something and they are not open to other things that can impact influence uh, their treatment or be more effective or I think it's just so important to be open and I loved hearing uh, your your approach the way you teach the way you treat so thank you so much well thank you Mariana I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to listen so thank you very much